It's five o'clock in London. It's midday in New York, midnight in Hong Kong, 3 a.m. in Sydney, 9 a.m. in San Francisco, and 9.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. My name is Patrick L. Young. The IPO Vid Livestream Series 26, Episode 5 in the aggregate. That makes a lovely round number of 155 episodes. Starts here. And as the inf- internet meme goes, a few moments later. No, actually, make that a whole generation later. Maybe, just maybe, the NSE, the National Stock Exchange of India, IPO, is coming back to the table as NSE have settled their fines and SEBI says all investigations are closed. Meanwhile, in technology, Vermiculus keeps wriggling as it expands its deal footprint with Myax, the Miami International Exchanges, adding the Bermuda Stock Exchange to its CSD network. Plaudits, too, to our recent guests from Connemara. They were an IPO bid just a few shows ago. As I walked into the studio today, they unveiled a deal with Zero Hash. And indeed, they're also supplying Forecast X with their software, which we discussed a few weeks ago. And that brings us elegantly to our final clip of the segment. It may take a while yet, but the struggle themes to finally be over, ladies and gentlemen, after what has also been a generation of debate, discussion and more, in this case centred around one product. Finally, we seem to have a regulatory debate that is concluded. Political prediction markets exist. Bang on time for Kamala's 60-minute word salad. The Kalshi team prevailed in court with a 3-0 judicial review, and that means both Kalshi and IBKRs Forecast X are live and trading on the US presidential elections. Plaudits to Kalshi CEO Tarek Mansour and team for doggedly pursuing the CFTC, who've notched up yet another rather embarrassing defeat for the Benamira Commission. Of course, all this discussion and more was in Exchange Invest, the exchange of information, years for only $500 per user per annum. And indeed, we were once again significantly ahead of the predictions market debate. And I don't just mean my own role in being a founder of in trade trade sports over 20 years ago. Anyway, that brings us neatly in the world of fabulous innovations to our guest today, Patrick Wood. We're discussing what looks like a very long sentence, but bear with us, ladies and gentlemen. It's a fascinating topic. Credit rating securities and powering risk management in credit markets. North American Capital Markets veteran Patrick Wood is CEO and president of Delfex Capital Markets. They're listed on TSX Ventures as DelX, which is advancing a revolutionary fixed income solution for the future of credit rating volatility. Now, Patrick has worked for a multiplicity of different exciting banks on the street, both in the USA and particularly in Canada originally. Hello, Patrick. Welcome to the show. Where in the world are you today? Hey, Patrick. Nice to see you. I'm in Miami today. Nice to see you. Uh, How's everything in Amsterdam? Great. Oh, Amsterdam is absolutely fabulous. Thank you. As ever, it's a little bit foggy because that's the way Amsterdam rolls at this time of the year. But you know how it is. It's it's a wonderful culture where they make all the sorts of heavy breads and heavy cakes that if you tried to eat any of those in Miami, you would probably die in the ultimate heat. Whereas here, they seem absolutely the right warming substance to keep you going. (laughs) So, so Patrick, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, how did you sure. manage to get into capital markets in the first place? So I guess, Patrick, I've been in capital markets for about 30 years. Um, it was a family thing that brought me to it, but it was always the drive to be an entrepreneur, I think, that um, that always interested me in it. I, I love capital markets, how they function. And I, I also, you know, had a passion as a young kid for for making money. So 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 that was the the ultimate driver to get me to to the point where, you know, currently, you know, like I said, it's been a, about three decades in this space. So wearing multiple hats throughout. Um, I think, you know, everything from stockbroker to bond trader to institutional salesman to investment banking, Um, all those things, you know, really, like I said, it's been a a varied career, but within the same, you know, same space, essentially, which is capital markets. So it's a very exciting space, 
probably one of the most exciting out there. I don't think there's anything more exciting personally than capital markets. Um, but it's certainly been a space that has evolved a lot over time. And, um, and, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're chatting today is to talk about something that we've evolved. And, and we, we think, you know, it's a, a revolution. So, you know, in, 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 a, in, in essence, in the space that we're really targeting, uh, which I'm happy to share more and talk, talk more about. Fascinating. We're really interested to talk about it more, Patrick. And yes, it's, it's truly intriguing when you think about where the world was 30 years ago when we started our careers or so, because, gosh, the, the, the little TSX as it was, and you had the Montreal Stock Exchange separately and all of these other different regional Canadian exchanges, let alone what was going on in the US. I mean, it's almost unrecognizable, the landscape to this day, as we've become more sophisticated. Yeah, no, the landscape from from what used to be has, I mean, because, you know, my, my bailiwick in capital markets was generally fixed income. And and it's interesting, fixed income has had some evolution over the last 30 years, but not a lot. You know, back back when I started in, in bonds, you know, credit default swaps in, in 1994 were the new thing. Um, it was a novel market. It was very esoteric. Um, it was very specific to the bond world, which, you know, happens, you know, as, as we all know, is the largest world in capital markets. But, you know, we've really kind of seen that there, there hasn't been too much evolution in the bond space since then. There's been a lot of technology come into play with automated platforms and, and other things like that. But really, we've seen the, the you know, the real changes, um, you know, really hit equities, um, you know, as, as new novel products have really evolved in that space through ETFs, index funds. I mean, this day and age, I mean, I, I think you've probably got about less than 10% of the participation in the small micro high growth market that you used to have back in, in I'll call it the good old days of, of, uh, of equity capital markets and small micro cap, you know, high growth stocks. Um, so I, I've really seen the evolution there, but, you know, in the fixed income space, as mentioned, there hasn't been any product evolution over the years. Um, I mean, there's been a, a, a really no need for it uh, because you, we, you know, we've had such a declining interest rate environment for so long that, you know, protection securities, things that help bond investors navigate through tough times just hasn't been an issue until recently. Things have started to change as spreads have blown out, interest rates have gone up. Obviously, COVID was a big hit and, and it's got people thinking about risk again. Um, and, and that's, you know, kind of once again, that's the space that we're focusing on today. And it's really interesting, as you say, I mean, you look at this generation we've had of, of interest rates, and actually you can see it even in such simple products as interest rate futures, which didn't really get the benefit of moving from open outcry to electronic for the simple reason that interest rates were so low that most company treasurers had other things to worry about than actually hedging everything that was going on. And equally in a world of QE, we didn't really, I mean, we've gone through this amazing period where people just don't worry about the credit status of different companies in the same way that they did. I mean, if you, if you think about when we started, you know, around about 1990, I mean, the very first thing you were doing was before you talked about the yield, the price, anything to do with a, some sort of a fixed income security was to work out what the rating was, whether it was rated, what it had, where it was, and then you would start looking at the price of the thing and analysing accordingly. Whereas nowadays, it seems people have just got so used to the idea that, well, if it's really perfect, it's going to be bucketed here. If, if it's not quite so perfect, it's going to be bucketed slightly lower. And, and we've got this amazingly homogeneous world. And I think we've lost something. And that's where I'm going to ask you to walk through it. Because yeah. yeah, credit fault swaps, great product, but as you say, really the only big fixed income innovation of the course of the last 30 years. But I mean, credit fault swaps are essentially a binary option. I mean, your company's either alive or dead. Mm -hmm. At the point when it's alive, essentially your credit fault swap is insurance. And at the point in time when it's dead, hopefully your credit default swap is paying you off, right? I mean, I think that's a reasonable description. Now, Bond markets are a bit more complex than that. And my masculine intuition suggests that you're about to illuminate us in ways that that has been an issue and therefore led you to your new product. Sure. Yeah, so, I mean, CDS, the credit default swaps, are, are a great instrument. Uh, don't get me wrong. They're standardized. They've been used, you know, mm -hmm. very, very well over the last 30 years. Um, but, you know, they address a certain pain point. And, and the reason for CDS and, and its evolution and, and really, you know, why it was formed was, was essentially to protect companies uh, and, and owners of bonds against default risk. Um, and if you go back in, you know, into the early 90s, late 80s, um, you know, people had a lot of experience with high yield bonds, especially um, in the Milken area, really blowing up. 
Um, and there was no real way to hedge against that. So CDS was invented by JP Morgan um, and the big group there. And, and it, like I said, it became a very standardized tool, uh, became something that was used widely. Um, but, you know, with all synthetic instruments on Wall Street and, and in New York and, and in the world of bond markets, there, there's always a bit of a, um, you know, an, an abuse, perhaps, of, uh, of power. And, and that's, you know, if we, if we go back to 2008, uh, which, you know, some of your viewers, if not all of them, will remember that. But, you know, CDS was really a, um, you know, it was an abused instrument. And it led into the world of other synthetics like CDOs, CLOs, and other things that were, were great inventions, but they, but they really were fallible. Um, and and we, we knew that when the CDS, notional amount of CDS being covered in the market was over $50 trillion. Today, it's around $3.5 trillion in U.S. corporate bonds. Um, that's the, that's the, the pain point. That's how much you know, CDS suffered. And, and so the pain point, though, really, um, is, is the fact that you, you know, CDS is, is an older instrument. It protects against default risks, but it doesn't really address the, the pain points that that you know that happen with downgrades and with rating changes and and there's two things that generally happen with rating changes when when you know the big you know rating agencies you know the s and p's the moody's and the fitches of the world downgrade bonds and that is that you know one generally spreads on those bonds will increase so so the bonds lose value um, the other thing is if you're an insurance company in a regulated industry like insurance your capital charges or your risk-based capital increases and CDS doesn't address that. CDS is a very terminal, um, it's a terminal solution. So, you know, it matures, your duration is not covered in CDS. Um, it really is more like, if you think of, of insurance and, and, you know, we're not supposed to use insurance or our lawyers told us don't use that as a word because we don't want to think of this as insurance, but I, I think it's something relatable that I, you know, we can at least explain how, how the process works. But, you know, if you think of CDS, CDS is life insurance. Um, or, or sorry, it, yeah, it really is life insurance. It's really thinking about, you know, a binary outcome that will happen at the end. Um, you have a lot of, you know, moving pieces in CDS, you know, is does, you have auctions, you have recovery values, a lot of unknowns. Whereas if you think of um, def or, or downgrade protection and what that means, downgrade protection is, you know, you're, you're generally going to be an investor who holds the bond until it matures. You like the issuer, but you're worried about short term problems and short term problems, as an example, and I hate to pick on Boeing, but they're they're really in, in the news a lot these days. If you own a Boeing bond that matures in seven years, you're generally going to be happy with that issuer. But, you know, for the next you know few quarters or so, Boeing could be iffy. You know, it's already been downgraded a few times. And if you're an insurance company, you own Boeing. You need to buy yourself some health insurance, something that allows you to sleep well at night. And that's the product that we designed, a product that if Boeing gets downgraded more, you're going to be covered um, for those capital charges, that, that additional risk based capital that the regulators insist and, and they force you to put up. So so it's once again, you're looking at CDS, our competing instrument, which is life insurance versus ours, which is health insurance. And so addressing that pain point is really unique to us and, and certainly this new product that we're coming out with. So, so that's very interesting. So, so let's break this down. And I, I agree with you. I mean, in many ways, Boeing is an incredible company and I'm sure it's going to come out the other side of what have currently been a few local difficulties, but it's interesting to focus on because actually there is a company with incredible cash flow with an amazing business, with a semi-monopoly in terms, or at least an oligopoly in terms of what's happening in its product set. It's ubiquitous. Everybody knows the product. Everybody flies the product very frequently. But it does have this, this pain point problem. So let's try and walk through that a little bit so sure. that viewers can understand that the granularity of what you're talking about. So sure, absolutely. Um, first of all, on, on the let me break it down for you. First of all, on a very, very simple level, what you're saying is, if I'm at super investment grade, but I go to not such a great investment grade, that's obviously annoying for me as a fund manager, an insurance company, whatever, because I have to put up extra collateral, et cetera. So the right. product, first of all, can help you with that downgrade, correct? Sure. Yeah. So, so as, as you mentioned, I mean, Boeing is one of the only two commercial aircraft manufacturers in the world. It, it's not going anywhere. Um, however, in the meantime, 
as their planes, you know, lose doors mid-flight and they have a lot of other problems that we, we consistently hear about. You know, Boeing debt, um, so their bonds have been consistently downgraded and, and the trajectory is definitely to a more negative state. Now, you know, back in 2000, as an example, you know, if you were an insurance company, you were clamoring for yield because, you know, rates were incredibly low. COVID hadn't hit yet. And, and there was a real rush to, to higher yields. So by doing so, insurance companies took on a little bit of extra risk in order to increase their overall yields. At the time, there was no risk in the market whatsoever. We were in a declining, you know, very long 12 year declining interest rate environment. I mean, we spoke with with hedge funds and other managers, um, you know, who just I mean, they, they would say to us, we have no interest in protecting against risk because we haven't had to worry about it for, you know, 10, 12 years. And um, and, and so so that was kind of where some of this started. Uh, in the sense that, you know, there was a complacency and a complete ignorance to, to, you know, what has happened traditionally in the past every several years or so, recessions and big blowouts and spreads, et cetera. And so, you know, Boeing um, in 2000 would have been a great bond to buy. Um, and then COVID hit and interest rates started to go up as money supply grew. And as we know, Boeing intrinsically, so, you know, basically as, as kind of, you know, not macro, but micro to the company itself and very company specifically, they had a lot of issues. So the bonds consistently got downgraded and, and to the point where today, you know, they're right on the verge of junk paper and junk paper is going from a triple B status to, to below that, to a double B plus or, or somewhere below that. Now, if you're an insurance company and you own Boeing bonds today, assuming you bought that, that bond in 2000, you're happy owning that bond until it matures, let's say, in several years. But, you know, for the next few quarters or the next year, maybe year and a half, you're very concerned that, gosh, you know, I've had to put up so much additional risk based capital to meet the regulators needs. Um, so, for example, an insurance company that owns a triple B bond, they're playing they're paying about one point five, two percent of risk based capital. If that bond goes to double B plus that that number more than doubles. So, so it's a lot of additional capital that the insurance company has to put aside when, when those events happen. And, and so, so if you're that manager and you're worried about you know, the next short term, um, what we did is we created a solution which addresses your pain point. We, we have a painkiller for you, which if those bonds get downgraded to certain levels, as they get downgraded, we have hedge fund, hedge fund partners on the other side who in return for a risk premium, because the insurance company has to pay obviously something for that risk offset, the, the hedge fund will fully collateralize a certain amount of, of basically, uh, let's call it risk-based capital, um, such that if all those triggers are met as they're consistently met at some point when the insurance company is comfortable that they want to cover that risk-based capital, it could be on the first downgrade or the second or third, um, they can do so. Um, and this is a fully collateralized instrument on both sides such that there's no counterparty risk. And, and, um, and, and in that process, like I said, the risk um, is being offset such that the, the insurance company is essentially, they, they can ride out you know, a, a bad storm. Um, you know, the hurricane's coming through, but it's gonna pass very quickly. And if they have you know, a brick house, they're gonna be happy paying for, for that brick house um, you know, to protect them through that, that small little period. So that's the product that we've designed. And as a small little company, that's not generally something that a, a small public company should ever do. Uh, and I can say that because you know, I've been involved with the company for a very long time. And it, it's, it's definitely something more that Wall Street should have done um, or let's call it the bond market, you know, savants, the, the big, the, you know, the big people in the room should have done this, the big companies, but it leads to, you know, where we have had struggles as a company, you know, developing this product over the years. And that is that there really has been a lack of innovation and, and drive on the street to, to adopt new products and new solutions. So it's created a window for us as a small nimble little company who can move fast and, um, and, and break things to, to really come in and cannibalize this space uh, in, in the sense that we've got a, a, a novel, um, you know, great solution um, that once again has the backing of insurance partners now and that we're rolling out with insurance companies who, who clearly some of them are thinking very smartly about their fiduciary duties and that is to ensure their insurance portfolios against risk. Um, so, Okay, so so very interesting when you when you discuss it at a high level like that. But help me understand here. I mean, for example, 
I get it when my Boeing bonds are on the way down. And by the way, I also agree with you. I mean, the idea that Boeing is near junk status is a great, ins- it's a great description of the financialization of the aviation industry rather than a reflection on the company per se and its overall cash flow position. I mean, that, that's, sure. that's a very, yeah. it's, it's not like the junk bonds of old. Although on the other hand, I'd have to say, varying away from the conversation at the moment, uh, uh, one of the things that amused me the other week was I read all about, uh, I was talking to somebody and uh, we were discussing, they were discussing, do you think there really can be, you know, another big bond bull market again, blah, 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 blah. And then they let slip something about the Milken Institute. And they said, and you know, that guy Milken, apparently he was like something special in the bond business once. And apart from feeling quite old, it also reminded me that I think a lot of people have forgotten. I mean, a lot of people these days think 4% is a very high interest rate, for example, in trading desks, which quite worries me. But anyway, parking that. When Boeing's on the way down, okay, it's going through the investment grades and dropping down. I can see how that works. When you get to the point where you're on the cusp of investment grade and you go sub-investment grade, I understand completely that the product works the same way. It's essentially an option. You're buying an option as the fund manager and therefore the the hedge fund is effectively writing you the option and therefore going to pay you premium in in a a manner as you you go along as a result of the outcome of what's happening. So it's essentially a big put option on on credit ratings. But does this help alleviate the pressure on fund managers to have to sell bonds when they become junk? Is this causing, is this helping them to keep them in their portfolio until maturity? So, so that's a great question, Patrick. Um, so, so the feedback we have from the, the buyers of the protection, so the insurance companies in America, is, is pretty unanimous. They, if, if, if they feel that a bond is, is you know, really sour, they'll, they'll just sell the bond, they'll take the loss. But if they like the issuer, which generally they do with 99% of their portfolio, they're in it for the long haul. Um, these are not active traders. These are people who, you know, they, they have a lot of research. They do a ton of due dilly on, you know, the companies that they put in their portfolios such that, you know, they're ready to ride it out for the longer term, like I said. And and in that regard, they've never had an option. Um, they've never had a, a, a solution at hand um, like downgrade protection which would really cover them during that period of volatility, which could happen with some of their issuers. And, and, and like I said, that's the gap that we've come in to, to, to fill, um, is giving them that peace of mind such that, you know, forget about the change in, in the spreads of the bond. They're not really concerned about that. They're, you know, the daily changes, no big worry. But unanimously, um, they, they all say the capital charges are, are their biggest pain point. And, and, and that's what we've really, like I said, addressed with these, um, you know, with these with, with this new product that we have. Um, I think it's fascinating because you're, you're talking about I, I mean, you're right. I mean, the spread issue is always a problem, but the spread issue is only really a problem if you have to sell. I mean, if you have sure. to trade out and so many fund managers want to hold these bonds to maturity. And in the case of where you're dealing with a bond, uh, for example, like a, a, a bond that is a, you know, a, de- a decent issue or something like Boeing that we're going to expect is going to come back rather than something that's cratered, like, I don't know, a Lehman Brothers in 2008 or something. Yeah. It becomes a very interesting situation. So what happens then as you go full cycle with this process, then if the bonds credit rating comes back in, you what the 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 agreement is you go back to paying the insurance premium as it were or you go back to paying the option premium and then the the fund pay stops paying because it's rebalanced itself back in the zone whatever the agreement is well that's a good question so um these are generally shorter term uh in nature Mm -hmm. these um you know these new securities and um so so the feedback we have obviously from our hedge fund partners is they're happy putting this on for 13 months or so from the insurance companies they're not looking at this as a longer term solution they're they're seeing this clearly and and very much so as a very short term patch let's call it to to help them get through the, the tough times and and they have one option um they have one time where they can actually exercise this option now Meanwhile, they're covered all the way down as the bond deteriorates in value, as those capital charges increase, you know, the the coverage is there to cover those capital charges. But should there be an upgrade in that 13 month period, which, by the way, it it, I don't think it's I I mean, maybe in the last 30 years has happened twice. But um, if that happens in that very short, you know, time span, 
then then really um, you know they're they're out of the protection. Um, so that's why they have an option to exercise you know this protection whenever they want, um, as long as that trigger of, of downgrade has been has been hit. And and that's you know once again very standard private placement documentation that we formed mm -hmm. with you know one of the greatest legal counsels in securities law uh, in America um, and others who you know who we brought into the program to, to help facilitate this. Um, so and that's like obviously. I said, a key factor. I mean, that's obviously a key factor because what you're doing is you're giving the bondholder themselves a lot of capacity to manage their book because if they've got even a quarter to appreciate that they may need a little bit more capital put in front of this, it's very easy for them because with the nature of their own cash management, they can manage to easily accommodate that within what goes on. And obviously, if you're talking about a 12, 13 month period, they've got more than a sufficient window to manage to even things out. Because as we all know, it's not as if every bond suddenly going to go to junk. It's going to be a couple of things in your portfolio, particularly because these are the most heavily due diligence bond portfolios we're talking about. Correct, man. Correct. Like I said, it's um, it's not something that that people have had to worry about a lot over the last, you know, you know, once again, 12, 13 years or so, but it, it's coming back into play. And and as uh, rating agencies are being a bit more aggressive now on downgrades, because, um, you know, the dynamics at all levels have really markedly changed. Um, like I said, there, there's more action in the space, which which also I hate to say it, as bad as things get, you know, the better things get for this product in the sense that there's more demand for it. Um, but to the core of the, of the, of the you know, of the issue is, is the fact that, you know, just there haven't been products like this design for a while because there just hasn't been any need or demand. We think that that's starting to change. And certainly what we're hearing from folks, uh, particularly some of the largest fund managers in, in America, is that, you know, this, this is becoming way more of an issue, something that's much more of concern to them. And, and something they really need to um, to get behind and, and start thinking about. And, and, you know, for us as a small public company, one of the things that's very interesting is the fact that, you know, we know coming up with a new product um, on Wall Street, you know, there's always a, um, you know, there's always kind of a, a fear of missing out. So, so we have lots of demand for the product as soon as we, uh, like I said, get the product really rolling. We know that it's going to be, you know, kind of a waterfall effect of, of people getting into the product, uh, which which is good for business for us. Um, and, and certainly, like I said, as, conti as conditions, you know, are, are volatile and uneasy, um, there, there's obviously clearly more demand for this um, as things move on. So. So uh, when you're looking at when you're looking at the product, then walk us through how this kind of works practically. Delphex, your company, you're sure. essentially a platform providing this service. You're not taking the risk. You're simply offering a service as a platform to both parties in order to manage to hedge their risks and be able to avail themselves of these credit yeah. options. Yeah. Sure. So small little public company, Delphex, um, you know, which is nobody knows about us yet. Um, we, we hope that will change at some point soon. But, um, you, you know, Delphex in and of itself has one role. We, we uh, through our special purpose vehicle, which is a Delaware LLC, we are the issuer of these two new securities. We, we don't deal with any cash or any cash flows that come in and out. Bank of New York Mellon is our custodian. Um, what we do simply is we receive instructions from both sides. Uh, so from both parties. Uh, we have an alignment with another broker dealer called Castle Placements, uh, which is a which is a great shop out of New York. Um, they will generally fill the role of placement agent and all the, all the other things that need to be done uh, in this process. And in return, like I said, we issue these securities. Uh, we deal with all the documentation and things, um, but then we collect a fee, obviously. And and out of our fee. Uh, which goes to our special purpose vehicle. And, and we are a registered broker dealer in the U.S. too. Um, out of that fee, you know, we'll cover custodial costs. If we're working with another broker dealer, we'll share fees with them such that, you know, it's created a couple of things. It's created a barrier to entry because the big guys can't rip this off and do it with such a low fee as ours. Um, they have much more overhead and way more costs. So, so we're protected there. Obviously, we have a lot of patents pending and um, and other things that we're looking to build onto the product as, as this rolls out, as, as well as a ton of IP. But um, because we're a neutral party, it makes um, it makes things much easier. Because if a big broker dealer came out with this product, we know that there's always, um, you know, assumption of let's call it um, a bias, 
Um, so, you know, there's a lot of big shops on the street that people will never work with because um, they know that if they're running the show, their interests are not not taken at hand. And they feel that, you know, at some level there, there's malfeasance. And, and like I said, they're, they're not getting what they want. Whereas with us being a small little, you know, once again, a neutral party in this transaction, we really come out as a, as a big winner. Um, and, and that's that's also what makes this very you know interesting is that it's such a simple little product um, that you know we built with feedback from from actual people on the street you know who manage large portfolios who you know who like to be in the risk game i.e. hedge funds such that like I said you know it's just it it's it's very unusual that we were able to do this I mean granted it took a ton of time to do it and a lot of iterations and a lot of mistakes to get here but. To, to, to be here, um, like I said, it, it's, it's the fact that there's a ton of complacency, lack of bandwidth, and I hate to say it, a lot of older um, folks who make the decisions um, in, in, you know, in, in, the, in the street and in the world that we're looking to penetrate, that uh, particularly on the broker-dealer side, that, you know, like I said, it's allowed us to step in and, uh, and create something new, a better solution, uh, a better mousetrap, let's call it, but something that really addresses um, what we see as a growing and emerging need uh, for risk management. So, and, and actually, you hit upon a, a couple of really fascinating points there because you mentioned the fact that you're a very small company, but you are perceived to be independent. And actually, one of the curious things about the innovation in the bond market in the era between, say, 1990 to 2008 is that a lot of big names, a lot of very big names, somewhat sullied the pitch because there were a lot of feelings, and particularly after 2008, there were a lot of issues that people had that certain securities had been created at the whim of particular large clients, et cetera, et cetera. We don't need to name anybody, but it definitely, <laughs> the loss of trust in the overall market that sure. drove that forward and, and that created a big issue for everybody. Um, and it's it's very interesting to hear you doing it. And I'm really looking forward, we're gonna come back to that in a moment, but we're gonna give you a break now because I'm mind elucidating and illuminating us with credit rating securities, empowering risk management in credit markets. I'm here with the fabulously inestimable out of Florida, Patrick Wood, where he is today. Let's just talk actually about a couple of other things, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you know, we have a book of the week regularly in this slot and actually, it's highly appropriate because we've been talking for the course of well last week we had Lies poker by michael lewis this week's book of the week is none other than the big short which of course is the book that also managed to spurn a, a fantastic or spawn a very fantastic film from the period of the incredible crash Although i must say actually if, if it was my money i would say read the book the big short and watch the film margin call because i think margin call is absolutely sensational they had it actually on the plane when i was crossing the atlantic last week and it reminded me just how sensational that is about the pure tension of a dealing room in a bank that's potentially on the edge of going going bust great book big short it was inside the doomsday machine it was talking all about this wacky incredible world that grew up in mortgage-backed securities during the course of the period up to 2008 michael lewis found himself absolutely perfectly in the right place at the right time once again and writes about it in his own inestimable style this is an evergreen tome always worth having a read if you'd like to know what's coming up in our next book of the week don't forget that's in saturday's ei weekend edition absolutely free of charge to read as well EI Weekend. You can sign up for that at exchangeinvest.com. But of course, if you want to know what's going on in the world of exchanges day in, day out, week in, week out, then there's only one source of pith, a single source of information that you can possibly go to, the consolidated tape of the exchange of information, and that's Exchange Invest Daily, $500 per user per annum. And that can be found also at exchangeinvest.com where you can sign up for a free seven day trial. I've been on my travels this week, ladies and gentlemen, and it's been quite an exciting week all round. And I was, uh, well, I'm in Amsterdam right at this moment. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. It's the AFM, the AFM Conference Tech Day with Expri. We'll be talking probably a little bit more about that next week. Certainly there will be coverage of it in Exchange Invest from tomorrow. I'm looking forward to a very, very interesting panel as well with a couple of great former IPO vid guests. In fact, a trio of IPO vid guests, Albert Menkfeldt, Mark Schiedel, and the inestimable Paul Humphreys of BMLL. However, one of our regular guests on IPOVID in recent times is Reiner Zittelman, and I was in Poland last week, and I must say, as soon as I land in Poland, I'm reminded of what Reiner has to say about the success of what make emerging markets great. 
let's hear from Reiner himself talking for one minute about some of the amazing issues in how Poland regrew its economy after communism. Capitalism is much more important for poor people, for the weak, because strong people, they come along in almost every system. But for people living in poverty, capitalism is the only hope. Two countries, Poland and Vietnam, both countries have a lot in common. First, they were victims of terrible wars. In Poland, more people were killed in the Second World War than in any other country, of course, as a percentage of the population. And Vietnam they were in war with almost everyone. After the war, the socialist planned economy was established in both countries, in Vietnam and in Poland. And now since three decades, Poland is definitely Europe's growth champion and Vietnam is one of the fastest growing countries. And I suppose coming back to Patrick Wood, we're discussing credit rating securities, empowering risk management in, ca- in credit markets. This is one of the things that was most fascinating for me, Patrick, about the evolution of the bond market in Poland after communism is the fact that they went old school. They created their whole bond market and traded off the back of the stock exchange, unlike the supposedly enlightened first world in the US, the UK and other parts where we've been used to this idea of OTC trading between broker dealers and so on as being the the backbone of that market. Do you think, coming back to, to what's been going on in bond markets, that the evolution of more liquid, easier to use electronic platforms like the trade webs, the market accesses and so on, do you think that's been a huge helping factor in creating a better bond market and thus focusing bond market players on the other risks that they have to worry about, such as credit ratings and so on? So that's a great question. So um, the the street still generally is a broker to broker market. So it's dealer to dealer. Um, you know, you have you have a, a guy picking up the phone, calling calling his counterpart at another company. And, and that's generally how the bond market in the US continues to trade. Trade web, market access, all these, um, you know, all, all these platforms, I think have made discovery of pricing a lot easier as, you know, as have companies like Bloomberg. Um, but, but, you know, at the end of the day, the, the real market still, it's, it still remains actually, you know, Bloomberg chat or messenger as well as um, you know, people picking up the phone and calling their counterpart at um, at another you know at another dealer, and and I think mainly the reason for that is there just hasn't been a ton of action in the bond market, you know, like there was 20 years, 30 years ago. You know, it was a very you know buoyant market. You had a lot of liquidity. You had a lot of players in the bond market. These days, almost everything has gone ETF or index, which you know that's. That's a good and bad thing, because I think, you know, the electronification and the platformization of these markets is good from a cost perspective. But, you know, it has also built in this complacency among managers who should be fighting and looking for yield and special opportunities to to ignore those special opportunities. And and I think that's that's, you know, kind of I think that's a window into where the bond market could be headed with with people who are thinking, you know, out of the box. Um, you know, the, the smart money out there, the money that's looking for good value, looking for good yields. There's a lot of, you know, great quality paper out there that, like I said, is not represented in the indexes. You know, you're looking at, you know, once again, you're looking at a lot of market risk within those indexes that doesn't necessarily exist in, in the single bond selection world. So, so I think the, the really smart managers out there, the, the smart wealth, is definitely you know going to be looking back at individual bonds again, where, whereas like I said, they just haven't for so long, and so I, th- I think cost being less expensive. Uh, I mean, I think that's great. I think the the opportunity for discovery negotiation platforms have done a you know a remarkable job of of that. And look, I mean, it's definitely something that we want to do with our product in the near future. Is you know as as soon as like I said, we get these first groups of transactions done so over the next you know few weeks or so. We absolutely, you know, want to raise enough capital to go out and build a, you know, a, a, a platform, perhaps not an ATS, but something similar to that, um, which allows basically the, the, the discovery, the negotiation and the execution of transactions, you know, through our products with institutional investors. Um, so, so we believe in that technology spill. We think it's done value, but we think the opportunity right now is to, to go back 
and actually examine individual bonds on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, which I don't think a lot of the world has done for a very long time. Certainly not a lot of the institutional clients that we've spoken with. Mind you, though, I have to say the insurance managers are probably the most astute out there because they have been actually really digging into issuer by issuer and bond by bond, more, more so than, than, than others who are in the bond market have, namely mutual funds and, um, and of course, ETFs. So. That's really interesting when you when you break it down in that way. And just to go back to your product itself, let's understand how that works. I mean, everybody presumably has to fully collateralize what is essentially their risk. So how are you working towards that in terms of I mean, you're obviously not making the payments for anything yourselves. You've got all these different elements of custody sure. and so on. Yeah. How does that manage to work? Because obviously the, the credit risk of participants must ultimately be somewhat of an issue. Well, it, it's, it's interesting you mentioned the big short margin call. I mean, look, living through that period, we all know what happened. You had companies like AIG and a few others who were essentially being, they were taking the role of counterparty and, and not collateralizing or funding the liabilities that they were assuming. And, and that's why there was such a big blowout in that market is there was just, well, actually, let me take a step back. There were a few reasons why the market blew up, uh, not just not just that, but really the lack of, um, of funding and counterparty, you know, kind of, like I said, malfeasance really um, took took a toll. And, and that's what devastated that market. I mean, you had something like over 50 trillion in CDS notional uh, being covered in 2007. And that number, like I said, today is down to, you know, about three and a half trillion. Um, the market has been devastated and it's, you know, th that whole thing, you know, that whole blow up really scared a lot of people away from CDS for good. Uh, because that counterparty risk um, was still there. Um, and now Volcker, Dodd-Frank and other regulations that the government put in place, they, they did a really good job of, of ensuring that, you know, collateral was going to be there, you know, on a go forward basis. But at the same time, they destroyed liquidity in those markets. Um, so with, with our product, what really, you know, is another differentiating factor is both sides have to fully, you know, fund um, the one, the premium that they're paying for the risk uh, and for the risk protection. And then two, they have to fund the, the amount of liability fully. Uh, and it sits in a T-bill with, with our custodian um, such that there's no counterparty risk. We've completely eliminated that feature to this product. And, and I think that, you know, in this day and age, uh, I think that's a brilliant move because nobody wants to assume credit risk on, on, their, on their counterpart. Um, and so if we can eliminate that, which we have, um, then, then like I said, we're, we're, we're leagues above um, where other products in the past have really, you know, they've been fallible as heck, uh, especially when you have people, you know, making synthetics out of this instrument, which could happen down the road uh, and, and other things around that. Uh, I should note, too, I mean, one thing we didn't discuss is we we have two versions of the product. One is specifically geared toward insurance companies, which focuses on capital charges. But, you know, as I alluded to earlier, um, you, you know, there, there's also a worry when downgrades happen that spreads will change on the underlying bond. So, so we actually have a spread version of this, which which is, you know, pretty compelling for those outside of the insurance company uh, world. Um, who are worried about spread changes when when their bonds blow up, and and like I said, that that's another part of this, which which I think also covers a pain point because, as mentioned, you know you've had ETFs and indexes run the world for the last you know 12, 14 years in the bond market. Only now are you starting to see people step out of the box and say, "Gosh, I better I better start you know really tucking in and digging in and looking to where the real opportunities are," and and like I said, that. By doing so, people also need to mitigate risk. And, and like I said, I, I think that the timing is perfect for both of these things. So, so you, you say the timing is perfect, and I'm, I'm inclined to entirely agree with you. I have to say, I think this is a very, very interesting time for credit markets, particularly also because we are actually seeing some deterioration post QE between a separation between those companies that are going junk because of, say, financialization, as opposed to those who are unfortunately going junk because they probably yeah. are junk. The the interesting aspect to that then is, I mean, how how does this market develop? You you keep mentioning the fact that you're on the cusp of some very very exciting things. Can you share with us sure. where you think the sort of the roadmap is for the near term? 
Sure. So in building a new product, um, we always have to listen to what the clients want, what the users and you know the buyers of the protection and the sellers of the risk, um, you know, what what they essentially, you know, want to see. And so it's taken us many years, as, as I've alluded to, and thank goodness we have the best shareholder shareholder group on the planet who continue to support us as we as we've gone through this. But, um, you know, we, we got to the point where right now we have aligned with two major hedge funds. Um, they love the product. They think this is great. They love the the you know, the the avenue toward, you know, funding and selling protection for for downgrades. On the other side, you know, we've listened to our insurance company clients and they told us, look, we want to see capital charges covered. So we're, we're really at the final stages now of, um, well, we've, we've had all parties in the same room. Um, and, and now, like I said, commercialization literally is right around the corner for us, which is very exciting um, because as a small little, you know, nobody knows this type of company um, to, to be in a commercial zone. And, and I should mention, you know, the upside uh, and the upward velocity for something like this is, is massive. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I've stuck with it for as long as I have. But um, yeah, so, so we're at that stage, Patrick, where, like I said, you know, we're negotiating actually specific bonds now. Um, and uh, we expect to be commercial in, in, like I said, in very, very, very short order here. So, and that's that's fascinating. And and give us an idea of of the sort of room we here. I'm just curious. You don't have to name the funds per se, but what are the kinds of fund manager that are involved with you? Are they bond funds, or are they more sort of quantitative funds who love pricing risk and therefore are very very happy in order to step in and be effectively the writer of these options? Sure. So, so that's a great question, and and I should note, you know, the both the the hedge funds who are our partners, as well as the insurance companies who are the buyers of the risk, they are much smarter than us. Um, you know, so so the, these these folks, they really understand this segment uh, more than anybody else. So the hedge funds, you know, they will whenever they have an opportunity, especially in a new novel product, to to you know increase P and L, they'll they'll get behind it. Um, because they do a ton of analysis on their side. They, they feel that they can diffuse a lot of their risk by larger portfolios coming together. Whereas on the insurance side, you know, the insurers know um, that, heck, you know, there's a lot of macro risk right now. There's some company specific risk as well, which is, you know, which is, which is always possible, especially in, in a tumultuous kind of environment like we've been in and that we continue to stay in. Um, so, so really, like I said, we're, we're, we're just giving both sides here a better, you know, or, or not a better, but a, a tool for their toolbox, which will allow them to, once again, continue to make money and generate positive returns, you know, through through a, a very, you know, concerted risk management kind of view, the insurance company. And on the hedge fund side, a new novel product, which, you know, will change in nature as time goes on, I'm sure, because there could be synthetic ways of doing this. You can repo some of the risk at certain times, all that kind of stuff, such that, like I said, we've, we've provided a tool for, for the street that just didn't exist before. Um, and like I said, the, the timing is appropriate because there has been such a change in the interest rate environment. There, there are a lot of, you know, who, who knows what's going to happen next type things coming down the pipe. But most importantly, you know, at this stage, people are starting to think about risk, but there's no risk in the system. Um, you know, spreads have never been tighter than they are now. I think we're at all time lows in triple B and double B spreads um, in the bond market. So there's clearly no worry or panic yet. But as we always know, um, the bond market will start to react viciously to anything that, you know, fundamentally and, and as they add up over time, you end up with a certain amount of ingredients that, that will generate and, and make a very big cake of worry and, and fear. And when that happens, like I said, that that's when um, you know the spreads, all those kinds of things come into play, and and we think you know there's there's enough discussion and enough kind of you know concerted efforts now at mitigating against risk, that like I said, the smart insurance companies, the smart risk managers are out there almost in, insisting now that they have to use this product, um, so. Fascinating. So here we have a homogeneous new product, but it fits with everything that already goes. So it's a new Lego brick that fits with all the other Lego bricks of the bond market, the repo market, and so on. 
enhances the situation, potentially reduces risk for everybody, and also gives an opportunity for all manner of different participants to interact, which yeah. sounds to be absolutely fascinating altogether. If I may say so, Patrick Wood, what we've been discussing in credit rating securities empowering risk management in credit markets sounds to me like a very capital market revolutionary concept. So in fact, I think there's no better time than to introduce the question, where Patrick Wood, do you think the capital market revolution goes next? Sure. Okay. It, you know, Patrick, you, you, when we had our discussion, I guess about a week and a half ago, you said you have to think about the answer to this question. And I, and I have to be honest, I really haven't. But 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 I will uh, on a fly kind of say, look, um, going back to what I was talking about, um, you know, really company specific opportunities or issuer specific opportunities. I think um, ETFs and that world, um, you know, I, I think they're limited in a certain way. Uh, I think index investing, you know, it's great when times are good, but I think, you know, people, you know, should be looking at new and novel solutions, which go beyond that, which require much more thought, much more, you know, kind of digging deep. Um, and we just haven't seen that for a very long time. So I think that, the, I think the need for that, and I think the willingness to do that is, is, is coming back into play. Certainly with the smartest people in the room who we, we have the opportunity to spend time with, they're starting to think that way again. Um, I think AI is a very interesting thing. I know, you know, our, our, I know for sure that that's something that the market is really considering right now. Um, let's let's face it. I mean, AI has been around for 20 years. There's nothing new about AI. It's more just the the funding right now and the spe you know the expenditures on AI, which are coming into play more than they have been in the past. I think that could be something that has you know interesting implications for the market going forward. And, and I don't know how, but I think it could it could mean, you know, more, you know, kind of ETF index investing, more of an emphasis on that. I don't think AI in particular can do the same role as a very smart, experienced fund manager or somebody, you know, who's been on a, you know, on a desk for a very long time who really understands the market. I think that the world is very far from that point. But for, for the masses, I think AI generally as a tool is going to come back into play and, and or, or come more into play, but also support this this notion of the, the ETFs and the index investing uh, crowd. Um, but overall, like I said, I think the real opportunities, not just in bonds, by the way, I think one of the greatest opportunities that the world is missing right now is the micro small cap world of equities. Um, there's just been no love for that market for, gosh, 12 years once again. Um, and there are some incredibly you know, strong opportunities across all sectors in that space where, you know, these companies have had no opportunity to fund and expand their businesses. So most of them have had to bootstrap or, or you know, really, you know, on their hands and knees begging for more capital from shareholders to keep going. Um, but I think that, you know, as a rotation builds into the market, I think that marketplace is very, very exciting. Um, because like I said, it's been it's been a deadbeat now for over a decade. And um, and as such, you know, there, there's I think there's a big opportunity there. Um, I don't know. Does answer the question, Pat? I think it answers. I think you answered the question twice, actually, Patrick. Brilliant. Yeah, okay. Okay. As you talked about, I think the small cap opportunity is quite incredible. I think it's also quite interesting. I mean, you use that phrase, the smartest guys in the room. And actually, the last generation round, when we used that phrase, the smartest guys in the room, it turned out that the smartest yeah. guys weren't very smart in the long term yeah. because they hadn't really thought things through. Whereas I get the suspicion that maybe this time a lot more holistic thinking has taken place, which exactly. hopefully yeah. that will that will manage to be thought into the AI rather than ghosting it. I was fascinated this morning. We were on a trip with the Association of Futures Markets, the AFM crew, ahead of tomorrow's Technology Day, which was intriguing because we went to Almera, to the biggest flower market in the world and we're watching this chaotic site which looked like cars meets minions on steroids with lots of little electric chariots driving around with all of the flowers that wherever you are in the world today ladies and gentlemen you'll be able to buy tomorrow in the shops the flowers that i saw being auctioned today and it was quite incredible because this man confidently announced that the whole interaction was so complex that there was no way that artificial intelligence could replace it and i was looking down on it and thinking well it may be a little bit more complex and fast moving than the East Coast docks of the United States of America, but I'm not so convinced that AI doesn't have a future for it. But anyway, what do I know? Patrick, 
This has been an absolutely thrilling discussion altogether. Credit rating securities, empowering risk management of credit markets. Thank you very much to those who gave us a like. Really, really appreciate that. It helps the AI bots understand how great this content is. I think you broke things down for us beautifully. I'm really excited to learn about what's going on with Delphex. I'd like you to keep in touch with us, please. I hope we can actually bring you back on the show and talk more about what's going on here because I think whether it's rain, hail or shine, something has got to give in this bond market at the moment. And I think you're in an incredible position to prosper for it. So I'm really, really excited. I think this is an amazing company. Look the, look the company up on TSXV. It's, uh, it's there, it's listed on the small cap market in, in Canada. Fascinating. Really, really appreciate your time talking about these credit risk securities. I think it's a very, very, very interesting time altogether. That is our show for this week, ladies and gentlemen. I want to say a huge thanks to our excellent guest, Patrick Woods, who's coming to us today from Miami in Florida. I want to say a huge thank you to our magnificent production team, Desiree, Natalie, Racy. Hello also to Kim, who I saw was doing some work in the background. Next week, I'm not quite sure where in the world I'm going to be next week, but the good thing is we will be here with a show and it's going to be a real thriller. We've got a lady called Paulina Bren. She's a lecturer from Vassar College. She has written a gripping, scintillating book, She Wolves, The Untold History of Women on Wall Street. That's going to be our episode number 156 coming to you next Tuesday at the same time. Although, as I say, I'll be in the same place. Watch out for Paulina Bren then. Thank you to everybody watching today. Thank you once again very much, Patrick Wood. This has been a fabulous episode number 155 of IPO Vid. Catch us every day at the Water Cooler of the Board Business Exchange Invest.com. Do please subscribe because that's what helps pay for the bills and helps indeed pay for this live stream. My name is Patrick L. Young. If you've got a market you'd like built anywhere in the world, ladies and gentlemen, get in touch. I just want to wish you all a great week in life and markets. <laughs>